Hello and welcome to Pennington AG Church Online, as we are into our second week of our Upside Down Kingdom series, where we are inviting Jesus to challenge us and to flip our assumptions about life, strength, and power upside down. Right now, I am recording this during a time of quarantine in our country and in New Jersey. And during this time of how do we reopen and what does life look like, a lot of emotional feelings running around, I encourage you during this time to remain teachable, to listen more than you speak, and to allow Jesus to continue to speak into your heart and into your mind about who he wants you to be. In Jesus' Beatitudes, he is far more focused on your character than he is your activity. And so invite him in. Who have you called me to be? Who are you shaping me to be? Let's dive in together. Matthew 5, verse 3. We see in Matthew 5, verse 3, the beginning of Jesus' teachings. He begins to teach us what a blessed life looks like and what those values are. He begins with poor. Blessed are the poor. You probably know this passage as, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Let's look at it together, Matthew 5, verse 3. Jesus says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You probably know this passage in NIV, or its more traditional phrasing sounds like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And to give us a little more clarity about what Jesus means in this, we're going to read in Eugene Peterson's message translation. He says, You are blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. And so this morning, as we look at being poor in spirit, we are grasping on to the idea of blessed are those who realize their need for help from their Heavenly Father. And let's begin by the very first word. The very first word is blessed. Blessed are. Blessings for. And I want to encourage you today. You may be in a period of your life. You may be in a season where you don't feel very blessed. And I want you to know God's plan for your life is a plan of blessing. God wants you to be blessed. Eight times in the first eight verses of this sermon... Are the word blessed. Eight times he says blessed. Blessed are. Blessings for. He desires your life to be blessed. It's the first word of this sermon. And in the Gospel of Luke, in the beginning story about Jesus coming into the world, it's all blessings and celebration and joy. Four times when Jesus' birth is announced and predicted, people burst into song. And they sing about how great it will be, how great Jesus is, what his life means for us, the blessings that come through him. The first sermon recorded of Jesus in Luke chapter 4, he preaches about the blessing he is bringing to the poor, the blessing he is bringing to the oppressed, the blessing he is bringing to the sick. Jesus has come to bless his people. In fact, most popular right now over the last two months is a song called The Blessing. You may have seen a million different times versions of it mashed up with people singing over Zoom calls, all harmonized together, singing about Numbers chapter 6 and the blessings God wants in our lives. God is for you, not against you. God has come that you would have a blessed, fulfilled life. In fact, Jesus says it in John chapter 10, verse 10. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. God wants you to be blessed. He wants us to live our days continually experiencing innermost satisfaction, that we would see our value, experience his love and peace. And from these three, we would overflow joy in our lives. But into that blessing, I want to make clear that Jesus' goal in this is that spiritual blessings are far better than material blessings. And that blessings in the New Testament rarely refer to material health or wealth. Spiritual blessings never change. Material blessings come and go. We have them and we can quickly lose them. We can find them and they can quickly deceive us or disappoint us. Jesus says his blessings come and they never disappoint and they never leave. They are eternal for us. Blessed and blessing occur 72 times and 18 times in the New Testament, respectively. 
And every single time, they refer to internal spiritual blessing and not external physical health or wealth. And even in this sermon, we may come into it asking Jesus to tell us the future. Jesus, shine light on what is unknown. What is my life going to be like? How am I going to achieve this? We want him to share the unknown to us. Reveal it, Jesus. And what regularly Jesus teaches us in the gospel stories is he says, rather than fixate on what we don't know, focus your heart and your mind on what is known, on the character of God that is known, his plans for your life that are known, his will for you. And so we see Jesus teach us that as we focus on what is known, we bring that reality and the strength of it into the unknown. Matthew 5, verse 3. Let's dive into it. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. When I was in college, I was not very good at maintaining my physical possessions. I'm still not the best at it. My wife can tell you that, but I've gotten much better as an adult. But in college, I didn't really maintain my car as well. And as a result of it, my old 1991 Mitsubishi Eclipse uh, had a gasket blow out. And so it was overheating and, and the coolant was leaking out of it. And so I said, Dad, what, what do I do? How, how do I move into this? And he was like, well, you got to wait up there, and I'll come up, and I'll kind of help you work it. And I said, no, I, I can do this. And so what I did was I filled my car with about a dozen gallons of water, and I drove the approximately 35 miles from my college campus home, and every time I saw the heat rise in my car, I knew it was out of coolant, and I'd get out, I'd pull over, I'd get another gallon of water, I'd fill it back up, I'd hop back in, I'd drive all the way down because I was like, I can do this, I can manage this, I'm, I'm a son of a car guy who's a son of a car guy, and I can handle this on my own. I get home, I show my father, he looks at the car and he goes, well, you blew your head, you cracked your head, and the car is now ruined. I was so fixated on that I could do it myself that I missed out on the opportunity to ask for help and avoid the pain that was to come. Jesus says as his very first blessing, blessed are those who can admit they need help. Blessed are those who can ask for assistance and be vulnerable. It is wonderfully liberating to openly admit, I need help. Self-sufficiency, pride, and fear of what others think combine to entrap us in our own self-reliance. And Jesus says, those who can say, I need help, are the most blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. This reminds me of a film from 2010 sharing a story, a true story, about a hiker and a climber named John Ralston. And early on in the 2000s, he was hiking and he was in great shape. He was in his 20s and he was experienced for years doing this. He grew up in Utah and had done slot canyons all his life. And normally when you hike and when you climb, you have two rules that you follow. The first one is you never go alone. You bring someone with you. So if something happens, they can help or go find help. And two, you let people know when you're going and when you will be back. So if you're not, they can begin rescuing or, or search for you or find help. He had done it so often and was so self-reliant and confident in his own abilities that he said, I'm not going to tell anybody, I'm not going to bring anyone, I'm just going to go myself. And casually, he biked out into the desert, found slot canes, and was climbing around. And as he was climbing a difficult slot, a boulder broke loose. He fell to the bottom of the slot. The boulder fell and trapped his arm against the wall. And he was trapped there for five days, 127 hours is the name of the film. And I love the way that the director shares the story because he's trapped there for five days and you see his struggle. You see as he runs out of water and he has no food and he begins to lose his sanity. There's a gruesome scene. Eventually he has to separate his own arm and he escapes. And in his escape, he's bleeding out. He's weak. He's broken down and humbled by this experience. And the music swells and you see a family hiking and he screams out in this moment, I need help. It's a powerful moment when each of us comes to the realization that we are not our own saviors. We are not the own masters of our domain. We need help. And what Jesus says is, blessed are those who can realize this. In fact, Revelation 3.17 is a story about Jesus returning one day in the future, and he challenges his church in a very scary way. He says it like this. You say, he's speaking to us, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. 
One of the greatest struggles of our modern existence is individualism and invulnerability. That we feel like we can't admit that we need help. I can't even live communally because I can't let others into my existence. And we learn to front it. We have social media accounts and multiple ones where we practice fronting. This is not who I truly am, but it's what I want you to see about me. And I'm going to communicate strength, wealth, and health to all of you. If you got it, flaunt it. Fake it until you make it. Don't let them see you cry. We fake invulnerability to others to appear strong. And eventually, we condition ourselves to not experience pain at all. We just lie and we say it's not there. We say the weakness isn't there. The hurts aren't there. And we begin to numb ourselves of our own vulnerability. Brené Brown, who famous for her TED Talk on vulnerability, and she's written extensively about the need to ask others for help and the freedom that comes from that, she says it like this. The problem is that you cannot selectively numb emotions. You can't numb those hard feelings without numbing the other affects and emotions. When we numb those, we numb joy, we numb gratitude, we numb happiness, and then we are miserable, and we are looking for purpose and meaning. And then we feel vulnerable, so we have a couple of beers and a banana nut muffin, and it becomes a dangerous cycle of numbing, indulging, vulnerability over our shame of indulging, and numbing again. When Jesus says, blessed are those who can live fully vulnerable, who can live for real about who they are, totally exposed and totally engaged with the world, saying, here I am and experience all of me in this life. The more honest we are, the more free we are. Not only is it that we miss out on the power of vulnerability when we can't ask for help, when we are not poor in spirit, but the New Testament makes it clear that the discrepancy, the distance between God and man, the amount of help we need to restore back our spiritual righteousness is so vast that it's not just self-delusion, that it is the essence of defying the purpose of the Bible, the purpose of the good news, the purpose of God's love for man. When we say we don't need help, we deny the reason that Jesus Christ came for us. Jesus shows us here that we are spiritually destitute. The word poor in spirit, the New Testament uses two words in the Greek for poor. One is working poor. You have a job, but you're kind of living paycheck to paycheck, hand over fist. Um, you struggle through each week, um, and you're just kind of getting by, the working poor. The other word is destitute. You have nothing. You don't have a home. You don't have a job. You're completely and utterly dependent and at risk. And the word poor Jesus uses is destitute. Those who are destitute in spirit. And Jesus elaborates this in John 15, verse 5. He says, For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is teaching our first beatitude, our first blessing, as the realization that we can ask for help, and those that ask for help find it in him. Those who ask for help find it in Christ Jesus. When we deny our need for help, when we deny our need for a savior, when we deny our vulnerability before God, we rob Jesus of his glory and we rob ourselves of the joy of our salvation. And you can see it in the life of a believer. In the beginning, the joy that overwhelms us, the simple realization of my utter brokenness, the sin I lived in, that it didn't work at all. I tried on my own strength and I failed. But then I heard that God loved me despite all of my failures. And he came from his perfect righteousness into my total and utter mess, my destitute brokenness. He came into my life. And we have joy in that. We sing with passion in that. And over time, we begin to live a little bit better life, a little more self-controlled, a little more um, freedom. And then we begin to think, well, I'm not as destitute as I was. I'm not as broken as I was. And we begin to lack the appreciation of Christ's grace, mercy, and love through the cross. And what Jesus teaches is blessed is the one who every day can remind themselves that they are spiritually destitute, but that God is infinitely gracious as he reaches down and shows us his love. 
Let's visit an example of this to kind of frame this up for our own realization. We'll spend most of our time here in Matthew chapter 19. We're going to see the story of someone perfectly self-reliant, well-controlled. You may know the story as the rich young ruler. He has it all together. He's a social media influencer with 100,000 followers. His home is 10,000 square feet, and he has a summer home at the shore, and he has a winter home in the mountains. He has 5% body fat and four kids, and each of them plays the piano and goes to prep school. He's got it all together, and yet he still knows all of his perfection, all of his control, all of his accomplishments are not going to take him from his physical life into the eternal spiritual And he wants to know what he can do to make that leap into eternity. He says, I've mastered life here on earth. And Jesus, can you teach me how to master life into heaven? What do I have to do? What exercise? What prayer habit? Do I just go to, I teach Sunday school now or a small group? I help with the kids. Okay, in the nursery. All right, those little steps to get me there into heaven. Beginning in Matthew 19, verse 16, he says, Teacher, What good deed must I do to have eternal life? How can I earn it? He's still focusing on earning and deserving and working for it. He says, Jesus, what do I have to do to deserve eternal life? What accomplishments do I need to get there? And Jesus tells him flatly how to earn it. He says, if you want to receive eternal life, keep all of the commandments. And his reaction in this moment is overwhelmed because for them to realize that's over. A hundred, that's several hundred commands from the Pentateuch. Hundreds of commands. I have to obey all, like four, six hundred of them? I have to do all of them perfectly? I don't even know all of them. And you want me to achieve and be obedient to every single one? And so he, he levels with Jesus. He goes, all right, well, those are a lot of commands. Can you just tell me what are the important ones, Jesus? What's the important ones that I should do? Jesus replies, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. And at this moment, he then replies with a bit of pride now. And he says, well, all of those I have done. I I got it. I've been able to handle all of those. And so I'm pretty close. And just what's the last little tweak, Jesus? What's the last little piece that I need? Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all of your possessions and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Jesus tells him, if you want to earn your way into heaven, do every single commandment perfectly. Rid yourself of every single possession. Live destitute and poor and obedient and righteous. If you can rid your life of everything and do everything right, you may have a chance for an eternity in heaven. And the disciples reply, shocked. The young man leaves downhearted. The disciples reply to Jesus, well, then who can be saved? Who can then? If, if that's the requirement, how can we do this? Who is possibly good enough to achieve eternity? Jesus says to them, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. And we know this verse and we use this verse incorrectly to mean whatever I want, I might not be able to accomplish it, but if I pray and God is with me, I'll accomplish it. I'll be able to get over that, achieve that, find that. As long as God is with me, I can do all the things in my heart. But what Jesus means is, if you want to earn your salvation, you've got to be perfect. Not just perfect, but you've got to rid yourself of everything in order to be perfect enough to make it. But then he says, but with God, all things are possible. You can't be that perfect, but I can be that perfect. I am that perfect. I am that righteous. I am that spiritually poor. I have rid myself, as Philippians 2 said, of all the trappings of glory of heaven. And I have lived perfectly humble on this earth. And I'm going to live perfectly righteous. And then I'm going to give my life for yours. And in your strength, it's not possible. But if you accept my grace, you will see heaven through my salvation. You cannot save yourself. You can't tweak your way into it. You can't earn your way into it. It's like saying to a NASA employee, be impressed by my Physics 101 class in college. It's like saying to Pablo Picasso, look at my little sketches I did with my crayons. It's like saying to Albert Einstein, I know that water is made of H2O. When we look at the perfection of God, 
any of our goodness falls flat. And we can't brag of our goodness before a perfectly righteous God. God's delight, his blessing is received upon surrender. And Jesus says, the sooner you surrender, the sooner you live in the blessing of realizing a God who will save you and love you and give his life for yours. The first step to joy, the first step to blessing is a plea for help, is an admission of vulnerability, an acknowledgement of moral destitution, an admission of inward failing, and to say, God, I need your help and your grace. What does the blessing of vulnerability look like? What's the blessing of being vulnerable? Blessed are those who realize they cannot earn their salvation, for they begin to realize the goodness of God's grace offered them on the cross. Blessings on those who can see the vast difference between God's perfection and their brokenness, because they see the scope of his love. Blessings on those who can live in vulnerability and transparency because they can live in freedom and be who they truly are and know that they are still valued and accepted through the cross. Blessings on those who can ask God for help because they will receive it. And those who ask God for help are the ones who find the kingdom of heaven. We don't boast about our goodness to God. We receive the blessings of his vulnerability in us. Luke 18, 13 through 14 say this. This is a great example for us to practice together. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The joy of a passionate worship of those who realize their need of salvation, to those who can readily ask for help. We find the blessing of the vulnerable in letting go of our perfection. A few years ago, my wife and I, every summer, not this summer, we would go to the shore and we'd visit the water park and we love to go on the rides as fast as we can. And we were watching a particular ride at the water park where it's a rope swing out over about 10, 12 feet uh, distance and you splash into the water, right? And people who are great at it will do flips off of it, cannonballs off of it into the water. And because it's right on the boardwalk, little crowds form to watch people basically fall flat on their face into the water and to laugh at it. There was an eight-year-old girl who got on the rope, and she swung out. Normally, you'd swing out, you'd release, you'd fly, you'd fall, it'd be a big splash. But she swings out, she doesn't let go. She swings back, she doesn't let go. She swings, she swings. Eventually, she slows down to where now the rope is still, and she's just hanging there by her hands. And you could see her hands trembling. You could see very real fear in her eyes as the crowd around her begins to chant, let go, let go, let go. And after what felt like a full minute, she lets go. And you hear her go, Ow! splash into the water. Huge cheers erupt for everybody. She arises up out of the water, all smiles like she's some sort of hero, superhero, as we all celebrate the fact that she was able to let go and find joy. So many of us are missing the joy of our life, the blessing of living a life, because we are still clinging to earning it. We are still clinging to the facade of being perfect. We are still clinging to the idea that we need to be good enough, righteous enough, and in control enough. And what Jesus speaks to us, his very first blessing, is the blessing of letting go and admitting that we are vulnerable, admitting that we are broken, and asking the good, gracious Savior that Jesus Christ is to come and help us and save us. The power of the cross is in admitting we are broken to receive his righteous grace through Jesus. Some of you out there this morning may not have a relationship with Jesus, and I want to give you an opportunity today to accept him as Savior for the first time. I want to give you a chance to, like that little girl, just let go. Let go of your control. Let go of your pride and accept Jesus Christ's grace and mercy. If you'll pray this with me today. Jesus, today, I am giving up on trying to control and earn my life. 
I am giving up on my own claim to righteousness and perfection and goodness, and I need your help. Jesus, I need help. I believe, Jesus, that you lived on this earth and you lived 33 years of perfection and righteousness and goodness that I can't. And then you died on a cross for my judgment, for my failure. You died in my place. You were buried in the grave and you rose from the dead to conquer death itself and to give me eternal life through you. You gave your life for me. Today, I commit my life to follow you. Will you be my savior, my God, and my king? And may I live in the freedom of knowing I am forgiven. I give my life to you, Jesus, in your name, amen. If you prayed that today for the first time with us, I just encourage you, click below, and we would love to celebrate with you. We'd love to pray for you and just send you resources and celebrate the new work Jesus is doing in your life. And I want to speak to everyone watching this right now, that the blessings of admitting the need for a Savior is not something we do one time at salvation, but it is the means of blessing and joy every single day. Jesus said, my followers are the ones who pick up their cross daily, and he encourages us every day to seek peace, joy, value, and eternal life through admitting our brokenness. And so I encourage you today, if you need prayer at all for something you're struggling in your life, a physical need, emotional, or what have you, we would love to pray with you. You can click the links below, and we would love to walk this through together as a journey. As we ask Jesus Christ to be our Savior and every day confess our need for him, we find the joy of our salvation. Thank you for joining us this morning for this message at Pennington AG Church.